Really? We always chose. We always chose. <laughs> Yeah. 
All right, it's uh, four o'clock, so let's go and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, doing good. It's cooling off, so we're not uh, baking in here anymore. <laughs> I think the AC is back on, so no more no more flex alert. So that's that's a good thing. Okay. Um, so last Friday, I graded all of you guys' homework ones. Oh, I forgot to put the solutions up. So I, I need to put the solutions up for homework one. Um, but you know, if you had it turned in by last Friday, which I, I think was with almost everyone, then I graded your your homeworks and I put the grades on on campus. Okay. And so a little bit how I, I grade the homeworks because I'm not sure if I talked about this before. And so I, I do grade your guys' homeworks for correctness but I only look at just a small subset of the problem. And so um, kind of with my schedule, it, it's, it's a bit hard for me to look at every single problem and grade them. And so I'll look at just a subset of them. And so for this past homework, I think I did, uh, I did three, of the, three of the short answer questions. Um, and then I, I grade you on that and I give you feedback on that, but everything else on the homework, I just grade you for completeness. Right? And so, um, you know, if you, if you can guess which problems I'm going to grade every week, then you can just do those ones and you would get those, that part of the points. But even I don't know what problems I'm going to grade until I actually sit down and grade them. But, you know, at the same time, you know, you are graded on completeness for everything. So you should definitely do those parts. But, you know, again, you know, I, I assign these homework problems to help reinforce what we cover in the lecture. So I don't, I don't assign homeworks just to try to waste your time. You know, I, I try to assign them very purposefully so that, you know, if you do the homeworks, you keep up with them. You really understand what's going on with the homeworks, then you're really in really good shape. I mean, first of all, for the exams, but also that you're taking away, you know, all the important information from the class. And so, you know, even for the problems that I don't grade, you know, I would definitely highly encourage you to look at the solutions for, you know, all the problems and check and check your own work so that you kind of know what you're, you know, what you're doing and how you're doing and, and you know, and all that stuff. Okay. All right. And so the plan for today, um, Oh, I did, I did post homework two, by the way, too. So home, speaking of homework, you know, homework two is up. I think that's not going to be due for another two weeks. And so you have a bit more time on that one, just because this homework assignment is, it's a little bit lengthier because, you know, it's going to cover um, basically the, the next kind of, you know, week and a half of this content. Okay. And so definitely take a look at that, get started on it, um, you know, because it might, it might take a bit more time than, than the last one. All right, so the plan for today is, um, you know, we're, we're kind of making a transition in the class. And so now that we're done talking about, I would say the majority of the kind of the biology of, of, of the class, or at least the pure biology of the class, um, now we're going into the mechanics part, okay? And so over the next few weeks, we're gonna be focusing on what I call static biomechanic analysis. And so we're gonna be analyzing uh, the muscle forces and the joint reaction forces of the human body when they're static, okay? Um, and so, you know, if you remember a lot from your statics class, you know, this is, this is kind of where we're going to apply. Uh, but for today, you know, what I thought I'd do is I'd just do kind of a brief review of, um, of mechanics just in general. So we'll talk about forces, force systems, rigid body analysis, a uh, little bit of stress and strain today too, uh, just so that we're kind of all on the same page. Just I, I know maybe for some of you, it's been a while since you've taken statics. So I thought a little bit of a review would be, would be good to do. All right, and so that's all my announcements. And so are there any questions I can answer before we get started for today? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. They were doing a review of mechanics. All right, so first let me um, just kind of remind you that, you know, biomechanics, there's you know, besides all the biological stuff that you know we've, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, there's nothing really special about biomechanics. And so it's really just mechanics applied to biological systems. Okay? 
right? And so everything that you kind of already understand about forces, force system, equations of motions, Newton's laws, you know, all of that is still going to apply to biomechanics. It's just that, you know, the, the subject is a bit different. Granted, you know, biological um, tissues like, like human tissue, bones, muscles, joints, you know, they react to, to these forces a lot more differently than, um, than something like a metal or a plastic. Um, you know, and that's kind of what we just kind of got done discussing over the last two weeks. But, you know, in essence, that's kind of all that it is, okay? And so, you know, before, before we kind of jump right into all that, you know, the, again, the point of today is just to review um, just kind of your, your understanding of statics, of mechanics, just so that, you know, we kind of hit the ground running starting on, on Thursday. All right. And so, you know, for, for those of you, you know, maybe, maybe you've just used a lot of this stuff and maybe you, you remember your physics class, your statics class, you know, so today might be a little bit boring, you know, because we're going over what a force is, what a moment is, things like that. But, you know, I remember some, something someone, oh, someone told me before, you know, I, I said, I, I told, I'm, I'm always worried that if I go over things that people know already, or they master already, that people might be bored. And so he asked me, he's like, were you ever upset when you were, you were trying to learn something and someone reviewed something you already knew? I said, no, that's right. And so it, it's a good feeling that, you know, you kind of already know this stuff. So even if you already know this, I think it's, it's good to kind of see it again, um, just so that, you know, we can all be on the same page for Thursday. All right, so let's start with the basics of the basics. So let's start with forces, uh, force balances and equations of motion. So first, what is a force? And so a force, and it's hard, to, it's hard to define force without using the word force in the definition, but a force is basically the, the entity or the pushing or pulling that causes objects to move or deform. So mathematically, you know, we represent forces as a vector, right? And so a vector has two main quantities. And so it has its magnitude, which is, you know, how it describes kind of how much force that you're applying. And it has the direction as well. So it, it tells you which direction that force is pointing as well. And so let's say I, I draw this kind of arbitrary potato looking object. Okay. And if we say that there's a force being applied at the, uh, at the center of mass right there, okay, we represent that force as a, as a vector error. Okay. 
And then depending on whether this object is, uh, is fixed down or whether it's free forming, then this force is either gonna cause this object to move, okay? And we can relate that movement with uh, Newton's second law, F is equal to MA, um, or this gonna, it's gonna generate some reaction forces from wherever it's fixed, okay? Um, or it can also deform in, in that way too. Okay? We'll, we'll get into all that later. Okay. And so you can have multiple forces acting on a single object. And uh, oftentimes what we do is that we, we can perform vector addition and get just a net force uh, on the entire object. And so the net force is a single force vector that represents all the forces acting, you know, at the same time. So let me draw ahead, go ahead and draw our uh, potato object again. Okay. Let's say that we have multiple forces acting on it. Okay. So in this case, they're all compressive forces. And so if we take those four forces there and we add and perform vector addition, then we can get a single net force. that, okay, where F net is equal to the sum of all the forces that are acting on the object. Okay. And so in this case, we have four. And so we have F1 plus F2 plus F3 plus F4, okay? So that's the simple kind of vector addition of those. But oftentimes, you know, when we're performing calculations, we like to we like to break this up into its vector components as well. Okay. And so for two D, you know, the majority, the majority, the vast majority of this class, we're going to just be work, work, working in two D. Um, just because mathematically it's, it's easier, it's easier to draw stuff. And so in 2D, we have two components. And so we have the X direction and the Y direction traditionally. And so what we can do is we can say that the sum of all the forces in the X direction is equal to, um, what it's equal to is the sum of all the X components of the, of the constituent vectors. Okay, so we have F1X, which is the X component of vector one, 2x plus f3x plus f4x. We can do the same thing for y as well. And so what we can do from here, and, and the reason we like to break it up into components is we can set each of these force sums equal to the equations of motion, okay? And so in the X direction, we have the mass of the object multiplied by its 
x acceleration. Okay? And in the y direction, this is equal to the mass multiplied by this acceleration in the y direction. Okay. Remember, you know, acceleration is a vector as well. Uh, acceleration has a has both magnitudes and direction. But just like the forces, we can break acceleration up into the x and y components. Okay? And we like to do this because you know it's 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 mathematically it's a lot easier to work in the in scalar equations. And so when you break a vector up into components, each of the components can form a scalar equation like like this. And that's generally, you know, easier to work with. Okay? And so to sum it up, you know, we will have a we have kind of two equations that we work with a lot. And so we say the sum of all the forces in the x direction is equal to mass times a x, and some of the forces in the y direction is equal to mass times a y. Okay? Right. So those two equations that I wrote at the bottom are just, you know, the same things as, as the top equations, just kind of in more general general form. We do have a special case for these, um, and it's a special case that we're going to be working with, you know, for the first uh, all the way up until the first midterm, basically. Um, and that's for static cases. And so for static, static cases basically means that there's going to be no motion in the object at all. And so that means the corresponding accelerations are going to be zero. And so for static cases, what we have is the sum of the forces in the x direction is going to be equal to zero, and the sum of the forces in the y direction is going to be equal to zero. Okay. okay. Any questions on, on this so far? Okay, so hopefully this is all, all good review, right? Okay. And so those are uh, those those are what I like to call linear mechanics. And so you know these are forces that act along the line, and they cause motion in a line, uh, or no motion in a line, which is statics. Okay? And so uh, a lot of the a lot of the parts of the of the human body we are going to consider as rigid objects. Okay? So and so for rigid objects, you know the object itself has has area, it has volume. And so not only are we going to be considering linear motion. We also need to consider rotational motion as well, right? Because um, the parts of the body can rotate. And so we need to think about uh, moments and torques and the angular equations of motion. Okay. So uh, rigid bodies can also have rotational motion in addition to the linear motion that we just described. Okay? And so we're going to need uh, you know, different sets of, of 
of you know, parameters and different sets of equations to describe this rotational motion. Okay. Right. But the good thing about uh, rotational motion is that every important quantity in, in rotational motion kind of has a, a, an analog um, in, in linear motion. And so oftentimes, you know, when, when rotational motion is taught either, I think traditionally it's in your, the first physics class that you take uh, probably in college, you know, they introduce linear motion first, linear quantities, and then they draw the comparisons with rotation. And so, you know, we're going to do the same thing here. And so the first thing we talked about in linear motion was a force. And so kind of the rotational analog for that is a moment or a torque. So what we said was, you know, the force is um, kind of the entity or the, the vector entity that causes a, an object to move or deform. And so that's what a moment or a torque is. And so moment or a torque is the physical entity that's required to cause an object to either rotate or also deform rotation as well. And so let me go ahead and draw our arbitrary potato again. Okay. It has a uh, center of mass P. Okay. <clears throat> and so let's say, let's say that this object here, you know, just for the sake of, of argument, is going to be pinned at that location, right? And so we basically secured it there, but it's it's a pin joint, and so the object is kind of free to rotate around that around that pin. If you apply a force to this object, okay, so let's say that we apply a force just like this. Because this object is pinned, you know, that pin is going to prevent any kind of linear motion, right? And so, um, you know, as long as that pin remains fixed and the pin is still attached to the body, that pin is going to prevent any kind of rotational or uh, linear motion, excuse me. But you know, because the because the object is free to rotate around the pin, you know, this force is going to cause the object to rotate. And so intuitively, you know, you can kind of you can kind of tell what kind of rotation this is going to be, right? So we have a force that's pushing like this, you know, from the bottom left pushing up towards the right, and we have the pin there on kind of the bottom right, and so this is going to cause the object to rotate in the clockwise direction. Okay. okay. And the way that we determine, you know, how much or how much rotation and what that's going to be, we first need to compute the, tor uh, the moment or the torque. Okay. So let me do this. And so, you know, based on this pin, this pin support here, okay, I'm going to go ahead and draw another vector. So I'm going to call that vector R. And I'm drawing it in a careful way. Well, I guess actually first, you know, let's, let's forget about that. Okay, so here the R vector this R vector is a special one, and so it's a it's a position vector, and so it's it's something that um, denotes a position, and it denotes it it points from wherever the the rotation point is to an applied force. 
And so in this case, you know, since the pin support there, that's where we're going to be rotating around. The R vector is going to be pointing from the pin to the force F. Okay? And so with these two uh, vectors in mind, we can use them to compute the moment vector. So this, uh, this vector M, this is the moment vector, okay? Remember the moment is kind of the, uh, the angular analog for, uh, for force, okay? And the way that we compute it is we compute it as the cross product between the R and the F vector. So it's a bit more complicated to compute moments just because of this, uh, um, of this cross product. So cross products, even for me, are not, are not, are not my most favorite thing in the world. Honestly, I'd, I'd rather like sandpaper than compute cross products sometimes, um, but that's just how it's different, okay? But the good thing is that, you know, uh, a lot of times we can kind of, um, you know, man manipulate the geometry, manipulate these vectors in a certain way so that we don't have to compute the cross product, the cross product. All right, so before we do that, are there um, any, uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, and so to avoid taking the cross product, we can, we can define that R vector in, in, a, in a special way so that instead of a cross product, we just take a scalar product instead. Okay. Okay. And so to avoid, avoid taking the cross product, and I, and I kind of drew it like this already in, in the picture above, so the, the picture above isn't, isn't the best representation, but if you define the R vector in a certain way such that, you know, the, the two vectors that are perpendicular, then the moment is just going to be the product between the magnitudes. Okay. So if you have a situation, I'm gonna go ahead and draw it again down here. Okay. We have a force being applied here and maybe you have a pin support here. Okay. If you define the R vector in such a way that these two vectors here are perpendicular, okay, where this is the R vector here, And if you do this, then the moment, and we'll just define it as a scalar moment M, and so we don't need the vectors anymore, is just gonna be the magnitude of the force multiplied by the magnitude of R, okay? where the magnitude of R is just simply the distance, um, the distance or the size of that, of that vector, okay? And this perpendicular and this perpendicular notion is, is significant because if you have to uh, if you have the R vector perpendicular like that, then that represents kind of a very special thing. And so 
uh, in that case, the R vector there represents the minimum distance between the force vector and the pivot point. So under these conditions, you know, if, if you do, if you are able to compute that minimum distance between the force and the pivot point, then it has a very special name. So we call that um, the moment arm of the force. Right. Any questions on, on this? Okay. All right. And so that's that's how we're going to be computing moments most of the time in this class because you know we're going to find, you know, we're going to find the, the moment arm. Basically, we're looking for the minimum distance between a force and the pivot point. And we're going to compute the moment based on that scalar formula. Okay. Uh, but even then, you know, even in this situation like this, the moment is still a vector quantity. And so it's, it still has magnitude and direction. So what we've computed here is the magnitude, but what about the direction? And so if you remember from your, uh, your vector algebra class, you know that when you take the cross product between two vectors, uh, you get a vector in return. And the vector that you get in return is perpendicular to both of the, uh, of the vectors that are going into it. Okay? And so that means the moment vector that comes out of the cross product is gonna be perpendicular to both the force vector and the R vector. And so for 2D, for 2D analysis like this, where the F vector and the R vector, they're always gonna be in the plane of the, of the paper or the, or the board in this case. Okay? In those situations, the only way for a vector to be, to be perpendicular for both of them is if the vector either comes out of the page or goes into the page, okay? And the way that you can determine that is to use the right-hand rule, okay? And so, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways you can define the right-hand rule, but the way, the way I like to define it for, for rotation is to use your thumb, okay? So if you take your right hand and you kind of curl your fingers around the, the direction of motion, then the thumb is gonna be whichever direction the moment vector is pointing, okay? And so if we look back at this example here, okay? I'll kind of leave it like this. Okay? We know from earlier that this is gonna cause, you know, the rotation to be in the clockwise direction, right? It's kind of pushing it and it's gonna cause it to rotate around that. And so if you take your, your right hand and you kind of curl your fingers around in the clockwise direction, your thumb is going to point in the direction of the moment vector. And so for this particular case, you know, because the direction is clockwise, and you can test this out on your paper, if you curl your fingers clockwise, that means your, your thumb is going to go into the page. And so for this particular case, um, you know, you have a moment vector that goes through. All right, but of course for 3D, you know, this, this gets a lot more complicated. And so if you have vectors going in 3D, then you can have moments that can go in any direction. But for 2D, you basically just have two options. And so the moment can either go into the page or out. 
And so traditionally, uh, if you have a moment vector that goes into the page, we assign that a negative sign. And if it's coming out of the page, then we're going to assign that a positive sign. Okay. That means traditionally, you know, if you have clockwise, clockwise moment, a clockwise moment or clockwise motion, uh, you know, we assign those to be negative. Okay? Whereas if it's uh, coming out of the page, that means it's counterclockwise. And so we assign those a positive sign. And so that's just a sign convention. And so it's, it's not something that's defined in like the gospel of math or anything like that. It's just, you know, in order for us to kind of have a consistent kind of basis for us to do our analysis, we have to, we have to define our convention. And that's the convention that I've, I've typically used. And so clockwise negative, counterclockwise positive, um, but you know, maybe other classes or other people, heretics, they might use the other convention. Okay. All right, any, uh, any questions on, on this? All right, and so just like forces, we can also have systems of moments. And so we can have multiple uh, moments uh, acting on the same object. And oftentimes we do. So let's say we have an object here. Let's say that this object here is going to be pinned at the center. Okay, so that's the rotation point. And so if we have two forces here, you know, maybe force one is acting like this, force two is acting like that. Okay. And we have the corresponding distances. So this may be R1, this maybe is R2. Right, and so both forces here are going to be um, uh, creating a moment around this uh, on this object. Okay. What you might see also, and and you know we won't see much of this, you know, in the static portion, but you know we're going to be um, talking about this uh, in the dynamics portion, is that you might have what's called a raw moment on the object. Okay. And so a raw moment usually is kind of represented as a circular sign. It's usually given a symbol like that. Okay, so that's that's kind of a raw moment on the object. And so what you can do here, just like we did with forces, we can sum up all the moments. And usually, when you sum up the moments, you, you have to indicate where you're summing the moments around, and so you have to indicate where your pivot point is. And so in this case, our pivot point is point O. And so we're going to use the sign convention for this. And so let's start with the moment created by F1. And so F1 is going to be, you know, if we kind of trace that around, we follow it around, it's going to be a clockwise moment. And so we have minus F1, R1. Okay. Then we look at F2. Okay, so we kind of we kind of follow F2 around, and we can see that's producing a counterclockwise moment around O. Okay, so we're going to give that a positive sign. Okay. And then we have the raw moment. Okay? And so a raw moment, you know, I, I get questions about this all the time. So a raw moment is basically something that's causing, it's, ca it's causing a rotational force on the object. Okay? Okay? It's something that's causing a rotational force, but we can't, we can't represent it as like a force vector and a moment. And so the way that we represent that is just, it's just kind of just as a raw moment itself. And so the way that you incorporate into the equations is very simple. You just add it right in with the, with the appropriate sign convention. convention. Okay. Right. And so in this case, our raw moment is uh, given, is uh, pointing in the clockwise direction. And so we're going to make it negative. 
<clears throat> and the thing about raw moments is that you'll probably see them applied at different parts of the object, um, but the raw the location of the raw moment doesn't really matter. And so just wherever it's applied, you just add it into the moment equation, just, just like that. And so one example of a raw moment is, you know, if you, if you have a, like a water bottle or like a soda, soda bottle, right, and you kind of twist the cap off, you kind of are applying a force, like you're, you're gripping the cap all around and you're kind of twisting it like that. And so it's a little bit hard to have like to, to define that as like a force vector. And so instead, you know, it's, it's usually more convenient to define that as a raw moment. So that, that's just kind of one example of that. But if you see, if you see that in kind of some of the, um, the figures and some of the free body diagrams, that's, that's what it means. Okay, and so just like in linear motion, we can take the sum of the moments here and equate it to an equation of motion. So the equation for that is we have the sum of the moments is equal to IC times alpha. For IC right here, this is the moment of inertia of the object about the centroid. And alpha here, this is the angular acceleration. Right. And just a reminder, you know, the moment, the moment of inertia, that's basically a, a property of the object that tells you how, how difficult it is to, to rotate. Okay. So it's like mass. Okay. And so we know that objects with higher mass are, are kind of harder to push around. And so same thing with rotational motion. So if you have a higher moment of inertia, then you're gonna be harder to rotate. Okay? Uh, and of course, you know, we have the simplification for static cases. And so if, you, if we have a static case, that means we have no motion. And so that includes no angular acceleration. And so for static cases, the sum of the moments are even equal to zero. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, and so we've, we've reviewed kind of linear motion, we reviewed rotational motion, and so oftentimes we're combining the two together um, into what I call rigid body analysis. And so we're gonna be doing a lot of this over the next uh, few weeks. And so uh, if you remember, if you recall from previous classes, you know, the, the thing that we have to do whenever we're doing any kind of rigid body analysis is to draw the free body diagram, okay? So a free body diagram, what that is, is that we, we kind of take the object, we kind of separate it out from, from its environment, and we draw all the forces and moments that are acting on that object, 
So from the free body diagram, we're gonna we're able to form the equations of motion. And so we're gonna have the sum of the forces, some of the moments. And oftentimes we're gonna use those equations to solve for, um, I mean, you could say that we you can use it to solve for any unknown quantity, but generally we're looking for you know either one of one of two things. Okay? And so one, you know, um, for the dynamics portion, we're gonna be looking for the actual motion itself. And so things like accelerations, velocities, and positions. Okay? But for this first part of the class, you know, we're going to be using the free body diagrams to actually compute some unknown forces. Okay, so of, oftentimes, you know, we'll, we'll have situations where uh, we draw the free body diagram, but we may not know all the forces or at least all the values of the forces involved. Um, maybe, uh, maybe it's because, you know, we're, we're using force vectors to represent muscles and we want to compute how much muscle force is required. We can use the free body diagram to compute those quantities. And there could be situations where, you know, we, we compute some other derived quantities too. And so, you know, but generally this is kind of what we're looking for in a free body. Okay. okay. So the number of equations that you get or the number of equations of motions that you get depend on the dimensionality of the problem. Okay? And so for 2D analysis, we are gonna get three equations of motions. And so those three equations of motion are gonna be the sum of the forces in the X direction, the sum of the forces in the Y direction, Okay, so we have two equations from linear motion, and then we have one equation for rotational. Okay. And that's going to be the sum of the moments in the, well, we call it the Z direction, but that's the Z direction being out of the page or into the page. Okay. And so for most of the problems that we're going to do in this class, those are the three, those are the three equations you're going to need to form in the free body diagram. And you're going to use those to solve for oftentimes it's going to be three unknowns. Okay. And again, you know, we're not going to be doing much 3D in this class, but you know, for the cases that you do have 3D, you have six equations of motion. Okay. And so you have three equations of motion in the linear directions. Okay, so we have the sum of the forces in the x, y, and z directions. But you also have the sum of the moments. You know, because we're in 3D, you have you can have moments that can occur in any of the cardinal direction x, y, z. So we have some of the moments in the x direction some of the moments in the y direction, some of the moments in the z direction. Right. And so just like we did with the force, uh, the, the force system kind of earlier in the lecture today, you know, we're going to take each vector here, each of the moment vectors, each of the force vectors, break them up into the respective components, and then add them into the appropriate equations. And that's how we're going to form the equations. Okay, so let's do let's do an example, and so um, you know we'll see the biological form of this uh, of this example 
um, probably on Thursday, but you know, let's do kind of a simplified version of it. Okay, so let's say that we have a bar. And let's say that this bar is kind of fixed at this point right here. Okay, so that is our pivot, we'll call it O. And we have three forces acting on this bar. And so let's say we have F1 acting in this direction. Okay. And let me kind of draw the horizontal axis of this, this bar. And so let's say that F1, you know, it's acting at an angle we call a theta one. Okay. So that theta one is, an, is the angle with respect to the horizontal of, of F1. We're gonna have another force F2. And even though I drew it really crappily, you know, F2 is gonna have be in a different direction as F1. And so pretend that I, I didn't draw these two parallel. Okay. So let's say that this is gonna be acting at an angle of theta two. Okay. And then we're also gonna have a, a vector, uh, a force vector F3 acting at the very end of the bar. In addition, we also have the distances. And so L1, L2, and L3 there, um, those are measuring the horizontal distance from where that forces are acting and the pivot. Okay. And so, you know, in a situation like this, you know, you might say that, um, you know, let's, let's assume for a second that it's static, okay? And so we have a static case. And so usually in a case like this, you know, we're interested in a few things. And so let's say that, um, you know, two of the forces here are known. And so let's say that F2, F3 here are known. But what's unknown here is F1. Okay, so we don't, we, don't, we don't know the magnitude for F1. We actually know its direction because we, we, we have the angle theta one. So we're gonna assume that theta one is known, okay? But oftentimes, you know, in a situation like this where you have a, a force system and a pivot or a joint here that's kind of holding it all together, what you're also gonna get here are reaction forces at the joint as well. So Rx and Ry are reaction forces. The joint. I'm jumping. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Not the joint. The the pivot. Well, on Thursday it'll be a joint because that's 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 going to be a joint to the body. All right, so let's count the number of unknowns. And so we have F1, the magnitude of F1, which is unknown. Rx is an unknown. Ry is an unknown. And so that means we have three unknowns in this system, okay? which is perfect you know, because we know that in 2D, we have three equations of motion, right? And so from the three equations of motion, we're gonna be able to solve for our three unknown quantities. Okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and write out the three equations of motion for, for this one, okay? And so first, let's sum the forces in the x direction. Right, and so you're gonna need a little bit of trigonometry here because uh, you're gonna need, oftentimes you're gonna be given forces or I'm gonna give you forces in terms of the force magnitude and the angle, okay? And then you can use trigonometry there to, um, you know, to determine the components. Okay, so force, uh, so let's do some of the forces in the x direction. And so first we have Rx. Right, we're just going to go from left to right. Okay. Then we have F one. Okay. 
Okay, F1 here, um, that value is going to be the magnitude of, of F1. And then if we want to take the X component of that, you know, because this angle here is defined with respect to the horizontal, okay, um, then in order to, to get that, we need the cosine of that angle. Okay. F1 cosine theta one. I know what some of you may be thinking, you know, you might be thinking, should that be negative? But I'll, I'll address that in a second. And then for F2, you know, we have the same, the same idea. So we have to do F2 cosine of, of theta two. Okay. And if this were a static case, then we would set this equal to zero because you know, we, have no, we have no motion. Don't we have uh, F3, Professor? Oh, never mind. And so you may be wondering, you know, why did I pick plus signs for these two quantities, right? Because if you look at the figure right here, it kind of looks like F1 and F2 are pointing, at least the X components are pointing to the left, right? And so if they're pointing to the left, that should mean that they're negative, right? Well, the good thing about how we define these angles is that the, the cosine is gonna take care of that for us. And so if you look at the way this is defined, you know, theta one, theta two are the angles with respect to the positive X axis. So if we assume that you know we have x-axis pointing to the right, y-axis pointing up, okay? and so that angle there kind of starts from the positive x-axis and kind of rotates out from from there. Okay, and so you know just kind of judging on this figure right here, it kind of looks like theta one, theta two are going to be greater than ninety degrees. Okay, and so you know let's let's just put in some dummy numbers just for now. And so let's say that theta one is equal to one hundred twenty degrees, and theta two maybe is one forty one thirty five. 45 plus 90, yeah. And so what happens when you take cosine of 120 degrees, right? Cosine of 120 degrees is gonna be minus, what is that? Minus root three over two. Okay? And cosine of 135 is gonna be minus root two over two, right? And so the and so the signs are going to be built into that. And so as soon as you compute cosine of theta one, cosine of theta two, then these negatives are going to fix these negatives out in front right here. Okay. And so I think you know I think everyone's kind of done you know free body diagrams and equations of motion before, but you know I think what's going to be I think a little bit tricky for for, uh, for this class is that you have to really pay attention to you know what axis the angles are defined as and how that translates into a sign for your equations of motion. Okay. And so in kind of, and so, you know, for a lot of problems, I'll, I'll try to give you angles like this where they're defined in terms of the positive X axis. And so you can just use, you know, cosine and sine just like that. Um, but sometimes you have to look carefully. And so sometimes the angle might be defined with respect to a slanted axis. Okay? And you're gonna have to do some, a little bit of extra trigonometry on that too. Okay? So I think, I think that's the part, you know, at least from experience that people get confused about. And so, you know, really kind of think about your trigonometry, think about your signs, Think about how your angles are defined, and you know that's that's kind of the key to these kinds of problems. But for this case, you know these are um, at least for this example here, this is kind of the simplest one, and so we'll kind of keep it just like, like that. Okay. And so of course, you know here F three, we're going to assume F three is perfectly vertical, and so it's not going to contribute to the x equations at, at all. Okay. Uh, any questions on on this? Okay, all right, so let's do the same thing for the y direction. So we have some of the forces in the y direction. So we have Ry, and then we have F1 sine of theta one. Okay. Once again, you know, because we have the sine there, uh, I mean, it's gonna be positive, but you know, the, the sine or the cosine are gonna take care of the sine, the sine of the, uh, of the problem here. Whoever named sine and cosine was a terrible person. They named it, you know, it, it sounds exactly the same as 
sign convention of positive negative and so I'm just uh, complaining about stuff. All right, and so same thing for F2. And so the Y component for F2 is gonna be F2 sine of theta two. And then finally, we have F3, okay? So F3, you know, if you notice there, I did put a negative for that because, you know, we weren't given an angle. All we're told is just that F3 is pointed vertically down. So I just went ahead and put the negative there. But if you did want to put an angle, the angle would be 270. And so the two, if you take sine of 270, then you end up with minus one. So that's how we get that. Okay. And so now we get to the moment equation. Okay? And so the moment equation is, uh, you know, there's there's some nuance to this as well. Okay. All right. And so remember when we talk about moments, you know, you have to, you can't just sum the moments out for, for an object just by itself. Okay? You need to know where your pivot is or where you're summing the moments on. And so, you know, believe it or not, you know, for most, for most problems, it's gonna be fairly obvious where you should um, sum the moments around. Uh, but you do have a choice technically. So you can sum the moments around any point in this object at all. Okay. But oftentimes you want to choose your pivot point to be somewhere that's really convenient. And so for me, you know, for me, the most convenient thing to do when you're summing the moments is to choose a location that's going to automatically uh, eliminate some of your unknowns, okay? And so remember, you know, ultimately what we want to solve for are Rx, Ry, and F1, okay? And so if we can choose our pivot point to kind of eliminate either one or two of these unknowns, then that's going to be really key, okay? And so, and so the point where that actually happens is gonna be right at the pivot or right at the joint. Okay. But remember, the a moment is it has two components, right? And so it has the force, but it also has the distance between where that force is acting on compared to the pivot. Okay. If that distance is zero, or if that, you know, um, you know, if there's no distance between the force and the pivot, then that force doesn't enter into the equation at all. And so if you choose your pivot point, or if you choose your rotation point to be where a lot of those unknown forces are acting, then you can automatically eliminate a lot of those equations or a lot of those unknowns and make life just infinitely easier, okay? And so for this particular problem, you know, we can, if we choose the rotation point to be where Rx and Ry are, are gonna be acting, okay? Then we just automatically eliminate those from the equation because those, there's gonna be no distance between you know, where those forces are acting and are where we're, um, you know, applying, applying the moment, okay? Okay, and so if we, sum, if we sum the moments around the rotation point right here or the pivot, then only F1, F2, and F3 are gonna make it into our moment equation, okay? All right, so let me, let me go ahead and write it out first and then we'll, we'll kind of discuss how I got each of these terms. So there's the moment equation. Okay, so we have F1, L1, sine of theta one. Then F2, L2, sine of theta two. 
and then F3, L3. And notice how for F1, F2, I use positive signs because they're gonna be uh, rotating this, this bar in a counterclockwise direction. Whereas F3, I put a negative sign because it's gonna be rotating the bar in the clockwise direction. Okay? And so in here, I chose the signs based on, um, based on how they're gonna be rotating the object. Okay. okay. So how, how did I come up with this equation? And so remember from earlier today that we can compute moments as the product between the force magnitude and the moment arm. So actually, if we start from F3, that's kind of the easiest, the easiest one to look at, right? So F3, F3 is pointing vertically downward, right? And so the moment arm or the perpendicular distance between the, the pivot point and the, and the force application point is actually L3, okay? So remember L3, L3, L1, L2, L3 are all horizontal distances. And so the... Um, Kind of the, the angle between those two is automatically perpendicular. Okay. And so that's why we have minus F3, L3 here with no trig modifier because that L3 is perfectly the moment arm already. Okay. What about F1, F2? And so why do I have the sign there? And so let me go ahead and break up F1 and F2 into their components. Okay, so let me look at F1 first. And so F1, we kind of you know, draw it out, looks something like this. All right, and so if we draw a triangle like this, then we, say, we can say that this horizontal part is F1x, and this vertical part here is F1Y, okay? Where F1X, F1X is F1 cosine theta one, and F1Y is F1 sine of theta one, okay? Let me go ahead and draw the pivot point here as well. And so this O right here, this O right here is the pivot, okay? And this distance right here is L1, okay? So the L1 is the distance between, uh, horizontal distance between the pivot and the application. So let's look, let's, let's kind of look at F1X and F1Y and see how they're acting uh, relative to the pivot point. So F1X here, you can see it's actually pointed directly at the pivot. Okay. And so, you know, I know, I know F1X is only that short, but if you kind of extend that out, F1X here is gonna be actually pointed right at the, at the pivot. Okay. So to kind of follow it, it just goes that way. Okay. Um, and that's true if F1X pointed the other direction too. So even if F1X pointed in the opposite direction, okay, the result is the same. And so the result is that, you know, there's no, there's gonna be no moment arm for F1X. And so F1X here is essentially the same as RX and RY um, in that you know, F1X should not appear in the moment equation because it, there's, no, there's no distance, right? And so there's no distance between how it's being applied and where the pivot point is. Okay. 
Okay. And so F1X, you know, that component of the force is not going to show up in the in the in the moment equation. F1Y, though, on the other hand, will show up in the moment equation because you know F1Y is pointed vertically up. And this triangle makes it seem like it's not being applied there, but it's the F1Y is being applied here at this point right here. Okay. And so F1Y, you know, no matter how far you follow it out, is never going to intersect with the pivot point. Okay. And the minimum distance between F1Y and the pivot point is L1. And so if we go back to our equation for the moment here, okay, so where moment is equal to force magnitude multiplied by moment arm, then what we can say is that the moment from F1 and so if we look at the force magnitude, the force magnitude is just going to be just the Y component of F1. And so we have F1 sine of theta 1. And so this right here is the magnitude force. Okay. And then we multiply by the moment arm, which is L1. Okay. And so we can simplify this and rearrange it a little bit. And so this would be F1 L1 sine of theta. And so that's how I got that expression there in the uh, in the moment equation. Okay? And so you can follow the exact same logic for F2. So F2 is defined very similarly to F1. And so for F2, you know, in our moment equation, we have F2 L2 sine of theta two. Okay, just like just like L1. Okay. Any questions on how we got the those those terms there? Okay. All right, and so now that we have the three equations here, you know, we have our three unknowns. So we have Rx, Ry, and basically anywhere you see F1, okay? And so in theory, you know, you can solve, you know, if you put numbers in this, it would be a lot easier. And so if you put numbers in this, you can solve these equations for Rx, Ry, and F1, and then you would solve, you would basically solve this, this, this static problem, okay? All right, and so on Thursday, you know, we're going to pick this up again. We're going to start talking about just the upper body. And so we're going to talk about arms, shoulders, and wrists, and fingers, okay? And we're going to apply the same methodology. So we're going to look at, you know, we're going to look at my favorite exercise, the dumbbell curl. And so we're going to analyze the dumbbell curl and talk about, you know, how much force the bicep has to exert in those in situations and how much um, reaction forces are going to be applied at your joints in order to meet that um, as well. Okay. All right. So Thursday, you know, we're, we're going to uh, get into biomechanics. And so, you know, look forward to that. So thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, thankfully it's cooled off. And so I don't have to say anything wrong again, um, but take care of yourselves uh, and I'll see you guys on Thursday. Mm -hmm. It's like that.
Right, any any final questions from Zoom before I close it up? Okay. All right. I'll see you guys on Thursday. <laughs>